Well, I don't know about you, but I'm having the best day ever. How about you guys? Welcome to Sunday Fun Day. It's our attempt every year in the middle of the doldrums of winter to remind us that summer is coming. Maybe not right away, but it is coming. And uh, I thought it was especially appropriate since it was minus 15 yesterday that uh, we reminded ourselves that hope is on the horizon. Um, how many people love the weekend? Yeah. Half of you are with me on that. So I love it. The rest of you guys love school and love Monday mornings. Uh, how many people love vacation? Oh, yeah. How good would it feel? I, yesterday, I was watching a little spring training. That's why I got my baseball jersey on, watching a little spring training in Dunedin, Florida. And I was just like, I'm magically teleporting myself to the sun of Florida. I was like, that would feel really good right now, about 27, 28 degrees. You know, we fantasize about being on vacation, getting on a beach right about now, enjoying some you know, pineapple juice or whatever, eating out of a coconut. I think some people do that somewhere. Um, but, you know, have you ever asked the question, why are our weekends so important to us? Why is it that Monday mornings are really tough and Friday afternoons are very exciting? Why do we look forward to vacations? Why do we look forward to weekends so much? And I think the simple answer is that work can be a grind at times, can't it? Work can be a grind, making lunches, cooking is a grind, cleaning is a grind, uh, going to school can feel like a grind, trying to save money for a mortgage can feel like a grind. It just feels like a, an endless grind of life. And today I just want to talk briefly about this question. What does Christianity, what does Jesus offer in the grind of life? And today we're going to look at a passage of scripture in the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, then we're going to flip forward to see what Jesus says about that. But what does Christianity and what does Jesus in particular have to offer us that are working for the weekend? That was a song in the 80s. How many people remember that song? I'm working for the weekend, right? Couldn't wait for Friday afternoon. Couldn't wait to kind of get together, kick my feet up and sleep in. How many people slept in a little bit yesterday or this morning? Feels good, doesn't it? I think I slept in until 10 on Saturday. That was a nice feeling. The first thing that we need to remind ourselves, uh, and we've kind of stated this already, that work and life can be a grind. Work and life can feel like a grind, especially this time of year as the darkness and the ice and the slush and the endless gray days, it just feels like it's never gonna end. This, this winter's never gonna end or my job is never gonna end or my semester is never gonna end. How many students out there? Yeah, February. You're like, you guys aren't even awake right now. You've been studying so much. The word of God says this in Ecclesiastes. We believe it's written by Solomon. He said this, really encouraging Bible passage, by the way. He says this, what do people get for all of their toil and anxious striving with which they labor under the sun? All their days, their work is grief and pain. How many people would say amen? You need to get another job. No, I'm just kidding. All their days... Their work is grief and pain. Even at night, their minds do not rest. This too is meaningless. You ever been woken up in the middle of the night and you don't know why? You wake up at two o'clock in the morning, three o'clock in the morning, you have this sense of dread. You have this sense of, oh, I, gotta, I should have done better at that project or I should have finished this better or I should have done that. Or it wakes you up with this sense of dread that everything's the worst at three o'clock in the morning that your outlook, your perspective is the bleakest. And a lot of times it's an anxiety because of the last day that things are undone or unfinished or not done to your satisfaction. And so the author says that under the sun and under the, the days of life and under the days of work or studying, that life can feel meaningless. It's filled with grief and pain. And even at night, our minds do not rest. It's interesting as you look at the, the record of scripture, and by the way, if you're new today and, and you maybe don't believe that the Bible is the word of God or you're not even sure about Christianity, we just want to say you're welcome here. Uh, Christianity does offer answers to questions like this. And so even if you don't believe in the Genesis account, and even if you don't believe in some of the things we're talking about, I think you'll find that this is very relevant to your life in the middle of the winter time, the middle of February, as it feels like winter's never going to end, or perhaps the struggle of life will not end. But in the story of God, God creates 
in seven days, this cycle for us. And that's why we have seven days. We have this seven day cycle of, of a rhythm that our creator mapped out for us. And flipping over to the book of Exodus chapter 20, God actually commands time for rest. That in the story, as God was forming a group of people, the Hebrew people to be the children of God, that God actually says and commands that the seventh day has to be a day set apart exclusively for rest. It's interesting that of all the things that God could have commanded, he could have said, work hard and be productive. And, and yet God, in the very beginning of the story of the people of God, he says, I want you to designate at least one day just to rest. This is what God says about that. He says, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord, your God. On it, you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor your foreigners residing in your towns. For in six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them. But he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Now, if you believe the story, we understand that if God's got the power to put the sky in motion and the, the, solar, uh, the solar planets in motion and the, and the sun in the sky and the moon in the sky and to form all the animals on the air, on the ground and in the waters, if we understand that he has that kind of power, it probably follows that God does not need to rest. And yet he did. And he did that for the simple reason that he was creating a rhythm for you and for me, a rhythm for us as we think about life and the grind of life, that it's important that we spend some time resting, not working, not being productive. And as you think about the story of creation, that God brings, he puts the lights on and he brings the waters and he puts the sky together and all the, the planets together. And then the animals of the on the ground and the fish on the sea. And the last day, day six, that's when the first couple, Adam and Eve, are formed. And so Adam and Eve show up to this universe that's already productive. It's already got food. It's already got water. It's already got this beauty all around them. Even the diversity of all the animals and the dolphins in the, in the ocean. They enjoy all of this. And if you think about it, the seventh day was the first day that Adam and Eve were alive. And their first day was a day of rest. The first day of the first couple was a day of rest. And I think in our Western world, we've got an opposite. We've got the song, we're working for the weekend. Monday to Friday is the grind. And then we recover on the weekends. And yet in the rhythm of God, God asks us to rest first and then enjoy God, enjoy our blessings, and then to work out of that rest. We've got it the exact opposite. We work, work, work until exhaustion and try to catch up with some sleep on the weekend. But God's pattern is to enjoy that first day of rest, to catch our breath, to recreate, to enjoy, to have our best meals, to enjoy the goodness of God's creation. A couple of weeks ago, we have an annual tradition in the McGregor house. We throw a Super Bowl party. How many people love the Super Bowl? Even if you don't like the game, you like the halftime show, or if you live in the United States, you get the great commercials. We don't get good commercials in Canada. I'm still bitter about that, but I digress. Every February for the last 20 some years, my wife and I've had people over and it's just an excuse for me to eat chicken wings, really, was what it comes down to. The funny thing is that everybody that was there, none of us were Kansas City Chiefs fans. None of us were San Francisco 49ers fans. And every year, my team is not in the Super Bowl. I'm a Dallas Cowboys fan. And we are long-suffering fans. We haven't been in the Super Bowl since the 90s. So it, it, the game is meaningless because it's just an excuse to eat some good food and to be around some good people. And it just so happens to be in the darkest month of the year. So it's always a good time to get together. How many people love a good party? don't you? An excuse to have good food with good people. And that's a little bit of what we're reminding us of, that it's important that we remember the goodness of God, that we take time to celebrate because without taking time to celebrate, life can just feel like a meaningless grind. 
changing diapers, cleaning the house. I spent some hours, uh, you'll be really proud of me, ladies. My sons and I, we cleaned the house on Friday when my wife was out. And yeah, the one time of year I did it, so I'm just going to brag on myself right now. <laughs> but 30 minutes after we spent all this time vacuuming and cleaning and sweeping and mopping the floor, somebody shall name, name nameless on the front row put tortilla chips all over the kitchen floor. We just spent hours meticulously cleaning the floor and then 30 minutes later, there's a mess. And, and so I identify with Solomon who says that life is meaningless. <laughs> Cleaning is meaningless. Changing diapers is meaningless. Studying for tests seems meaningless at times. But as you expand even beyond the, the six days and the day for the Sabbath, the day to rest and recreate and enjoy God's creation and God's provision, embedded in the children of God, the Hebrew people, they had seven festivals every year. Isn't that interesting? God had seven days to remember. And then the children of God, the children of Israel had seven annual festivals to remember the goodness of God. Festivals like that God was the rescuer from Egypt. Oh, these are just themes from the festivals. That God rescued them from slavery in Egypt. That God was the provider of food in the wilderness that God provided manna from heaven and then later on quail, meat in the middle of the wilderness. God provided food in the form of rain and good soil to, to provide uh, crops and food. Later on, there was a festival called Yom Kippur, which is about the God is the redeemer. God is the rescuer. God is the one that provides the atonement, the covering over for our sins. And then later on, there's something called Sukkot, which is, God provides shelter for the children of God in the middle of the wilderness. And so all of these rhythms, these seven festivals every year was a very rich tapestry to remind the people of God as an excuse, kind of like the Super Bowl party, an excuse to be together, an excuse to remind us that life is not just work and toil and meaningless work, but that there's someone to look up to. There's a story that we're all a part of. And the powerful part of that is that God asked them to give money for these festivals, that part of their tithe out of their increase of what God provided in the form of animals and crops were dedicated so that they could have this big party. If you ever been to a party, usually it's like BYOB, right? Bring something, bring, a, some, bring some chicken wings or bring some Coca-Cola or Coke Zero, bring something. And that was really the spirit of these festivals that God, provide, God asked them to collectively come together, bring their best to have this lavish festival, this lavish party. And as they did that, they remembered the, their gratitude towards God, but they also were together. And so there was a communal idea, an idea that we're better together around City Church. I've got this bracelet that reminds me that our tagline of City Church is to share life and to shine light, share life and shine light. And these festivals were an excuse to share life together. That regardless of my crops, regardless of my harvest, regardless of the health of my animals, regardless of the health of my body, that God was the God that was gonna continue on. And the God that provided for my ancestors would continue to provide for my grandchildren. There was a very rich tapestry of stories being told and rehearsed and it was good for the grandfather to hear as well for the grandson to hear. It was a generational blessing. I love what Jody Picot, the famous author says about community. She said this, there's a reason that the word belonging has a cinnamon, synonym, not cinnamon, that's something different. That's gonna end up on the blooper reel later. Let me start over. There's a reason the word belonging has a synonym for want at its center, because it is the human condition. That word longing in the middle of belonging. And one of the most tragic things about our city and the time that we live is that so many people feel hopeless. That one of our research points as we moved to Montreal 12 or 13 years ago is that we were heartbroken to discover that in February is the highest amount of suicides among young adults in North America. And there's this huge, huge gapping hole of hopelessness, despair, despondency. And these festivals and even gatherings like this remind us that we're not alone and that as life can feel meaningless at times, as life can feel really dark at times, it's important that we 
gather together. That the tendency in the Western world, at least, is for us to isolate. It's for us to do our mental health stuff. It's for us to just take some time by ourselves. And there's a time and a place for that. But I think our friends in the Eastern part of the world, our, our friends in Latin America, our friends in Brazil, our friends in the Philippines do this much better. Because for us, Canadians at least, and Americans, that we tend to isolate, we tend to break off some of those bonds that would actually lift our spirits and encourage us and remind us that we're in a bigger story. And this word longing and belonging is very much embedded into the seven festivals and the seven days reminding ourselves that God is the God of our story and that we're a part of this bigger tapestry, this rich mosaic of people who are provided by God. In a similar way, I love this African proverb. If you wanna go quickly, go alone. If you wanna go far, go together. Canadians desperately need to live this truth. One of the heartbreaking statistics of, of suicide and, and things of that nature, a couple of years ago, I was working with a hockey coach and I'd been a chaplain at the McGill hockey team. And there was all this uh, really, we, we had a really great season together. And I was just heartbroken that as the season was about to begin, I discovered that the head coach of the team tragically took his own life and he had four teenagers at home. And the crazy thing about it is that nobody saw it coming, not even his wife. And so it's a really heavy reminder for us that we desperately need hope. Hope is such an important quality. Hope is something that we cannot live without. And we desperately need God, but we also need each other. And so the question might be, why? Why did God take the time to institute these festivals? Why did God want us every seven days, at least one day to set it apart, to worship, to, to recreate, to look up instead of just looking down at our circumstances? And I think one of the words is remember, remember. As our health is declining and as relationships with your parents are strained or maybe in your marriage, as your grades are not where you want them to be, as work can feel like a grind, it's to remember that God is the God of the heavens and the earth. The God who put the whole universe together, he cares about us. In fact, in the New Testament, Jesus said that I know the hairs that are on your head, that God is deeply invested in your story. God is deeply invested in your tears in your wants and your ambition and your dreams. And to remember that the same God who put the whole universe together, he cares individually about our needs and he sees our hurt and he sees our despondency and he, he hears our cries for help. He remembers. But I think another part maybe that we don't think about too often that we try to champion within City Church is that we say it like this, that we wanna be the kind of church and we wanna be the kind of people that pass the baton to the next generation. And one of the richness of these traditions was that, again, grandkids would hear from their grandfathers telling the story of the Exodus. And grandmothers would pull their granddaughters together and pull these neighborhood kids together. They would say, remember that as you're struggling with life and as you're struggling with health and as you're struggling in your marriage, as you're struggling to see if God really cares, remember that at one time God rescued us from 430 years of slavery. Remember in the middle of the wilderness where there was no food, God miraculously provided. If he did that then, he's gonna do it again. There's a generational impact to come together, to celebrate, to remember that God is the God of the heavens and the earth. Gratitude is at the heart of all these festivals. Gratitude for who God is and what God has done. It's easy for us to remember the gratitude of God as we come together, but as we isolate and as we think about our own circumstances, it's, as I think about my own life, I magnify my fears and God becomes smaller. But coming together for these annual festivals reminds us that God is big and God is good and God is great. Gratitude. Brene Brown wrote this about gratitude. She said, a good life happens when you stop and are grateful for the ordinary moments that so many of us just steamroll over to try to find those extraordinary moments. Life is in moments, moments. If you ever had some time where you've been sick or maybe you've been fasting, you haven't been able to eat very much, 
whatever you eat next is the best meal you've ever had. Isn't that true? Or you've had a couple of nights where you've been sick, you haven't been able to sleep well, and you have a, a, a day or a night of sleep with six or seven hours of uninterrupted sleep, it feels like you are the king or the queen of your domain. Isn't that true? Maybe it's just me. Life is in moments. And so, so many times we think, well, life is about going to Thailand or life is about going on a beach in Florida or the Philippines. And, and we love all of those things, but we need to take time in the ordinary. That the very thing that sometimes we complain about as parents is our, the work that's involved with raising our kids. And yet God has given us the gift of life. And sometimes we can complain about the chores around our home and yet we remember that years ago, we didn't even have our home to ourselves. And now the very thing that we complain about is the thing that God has blessed us with. Isn't it interesting how that happens? So gratitude is so important. It's a very important part of the rhythm of life that we would not just look down at the drudgery and the toil and the stress of life, but indeed we would remember that God is the giver of every good and every perfect gift. So we've seen that Work in life is a grind. We've seen that God has actually asked us and he's commanded us to rest. And finally, Jesus is the one who brings true rest. Jesus is the one who brings true rest for us. This is what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 to 30. Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find, what's that word? You'll find rest. Rest for your body is one thing, but look what he says, rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. If you'll give me the permission just to read that one more time, just to let it sink in. Come to me, Jesus says to all of us right now, all you are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You know what's so incredible about this statement, this invitation that Jesus is making? When we think about God, a lot of times we think about a God with a gray beard in the sky, kind of a faceless person. He's, we understand he's powerful. We think he's mad at us, but he's just so far away from us that we can't even really picture him. We, we, we can't really, it's hard for us to pray to him. It's hard for us to think about him because he is sort of a faceless, nameless deity in the sky. But what's so fascinating about Christianity is that God himself came to us. That if anybody knows the meaninglessness of work, it's Jesus. If anybody knows family drama, it's Jesus. If anyone knows the fatigue of work, it's Jesus. If anyone knows about betrayal, it's Jesus. If anyone else knows about the struggle of life against life and death and good and evil, it's Jesus. If anyone knows about death, it's Jesus. And what makes this invitation so extraordinary is that this is not a God who doesn't know what it's like to work, what it's like to struggle, what it's like to feel like an endless February of life and existence. Jesus understands and he empathizes and he understands everything about the struggle that you and I find ourselves in. The struggle of relationships, the struggle of work, the struggle of pressure, the struggle of an anxiety. Jesus experienced all of that. And so Jesus says, knowing all that, knowing that I feel your pain, knowing that I feel your struggle, knowing that I feel the meaninglessness that you are experiencing right in this moment, he says, I invite you to have rest. Now this work yoke is kind of a confusing thing. He says, take my yoke upon you. I'm gonna put a picture on the screen behind me. This is a picture of a yoke. And in, that, in the time of agriculture, what you would do to plow a field before the great caterpillars came along and Komatsus and all those dirt, you know, earth movers would come along. These were ancient ways to do that. And so two oxen would come together. They would put the yoke around one ox neck and the other ox's neck. I'm getting tripped up on all these words today. Anyways, you get the picture. Two animals yoked together with this yoke and together because they were the same 
size and the same strength, they would go straight into a field and they would plow so they could plant their seeds and then have a harvest and then have food. And what Jesus says, he says, come to me. All you who are weary, all you who are burdened, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I'm gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. He's saying, take your pressure, take your anxiety, take your frustrations and let me deal with it. Cast your burdens upon me because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. If you've lost somebody recently, Jesus understands. If you feel like you're in an endless cycle of changing diapers, Jesus doesn't really understand that, but he does understand monotonous work. Jesus understands. And he invites us to release those burdens and release those pressures and release those anxieties because his yoke is easy and his burden is light. I was looking for a way to wrap up this message. And it's funny, as a preacher, some people think, oh, it'd be great to be the guy on stage. Um, let me just warn you, when you're the guy on stage, God always gives you the story about the story. And so last night, my son, we were at a hockey practice and uh, at the end of the practice, he said, my phone was stolen. And so we had given him this phone because we want to stay in touch with him. He's 14 years old. And so it's important these days for kids to have some sort of way to get a hold of them. And it was a, a locker room filled with 15 guys and only one phone was stolen. And sure enough, it was my son's. And so yesterday, I had that feeling of dread, going to the police station, filing a report. And then they have this great app called Find My Phone. Have you seen this phone, this app? And so I got to see the pleasure of seeing how my, stolen, my, my son's stolen phone was taken all over the city. And I was just like, I'm going to go there. I'm going to get it back. I'm going to fight this guy. And then I remember I'm a preacher. I can't do that. But was, I came up here last night because, and, and can we just give a shout out to all of our setup? We had 12 people up here, 15 people up last night, putting all this together. And so just to keep it real, I was struggling last night. I came up, I was in a bad mood. This, you know, several hundred dollar phone was stolen and it was unjust and it wasn't fair. And this arena should have been better at keeping the security. Anyways, it didn't happen. I, I saw the stolen phone all over the city. The police said we can't really do anything about it. I'm like, great. It's pretty much gone at this point, right? And so I fell asleep at a normal time and I thought, okay, no, no big deal. And then sure enough, 3.30 in the morning came and I woke up angry. Just angry and upset. I just had that, I was brooding. You know that word, I'm brooding over it. I'm just stressed out and I'm anxious. I'm angry, I'm upset. And it took me probably an hour trying to calm down. It's interesting because the night before I went to bed, I read the story about Jesus in the storm. The story where Jesus is in the storm with the disciples, he's sleeping while the disciples are freaking out. And he says, don't you have faith? And I just, this picture as I was struggling at 3.30 in the morning with this anxiety, with this anger, with this sense of unpleasantness, I just saw this picture of Jesus sleeping peacefully in a storm. And slowly the word started to come, God, would you just change my heart? God, would you just empty my mind out of all this stress? I can't control this situation. I can't bring this phone back. I can't make it right. I can't bring my son's phone back, but you can. And even if you don't, make it so that I can wake up in the morning with joy and serve and be the kind of person that points to the joy of the Lord. My friends, the reason why I'm sharing this story is because it works. As I prayed that prayer, it took 30 minutes, 35 minutes, maybe even 40 minutes. But as I slowly came around, I was able to close my eyes with peace and sleep for the rest of the night. I don't know what burden you've carried walking in today. I don't know if it's a health diagnosis. I don't know if you've lost someone that you love. I don't know if you just feel like work is just an endless stress. I don't know if it's your finances, but here's what I know. Jesus invites you to get rest that you can lay down your burden today. You can lay down your burden on the very person who has the power and the ability and the compassion to understand and fix whatever is going on. 
We have a savior that died the death that you and I deserve to die. He carried our burdens all the way to the cross. And today he, he invites us to take that clenched up fist and to drop it. To take the very thing that's keeping you up at night, the very thing that you're worried about, the thing that's putting tears on your pillow at night, and just to say, God, I release my burden to you because your burden is light. I'd just like to pray for you today and pray for myself because the power of the word is when we actually do it. It's one thing to know that Jesus' burden is to give us an emptying of our burdens. It's another thing for us to practice it. And my hope today is that as I pray that you would begin to start releasing that thing that's been going on for weeks or months or even perhaps years, the very thing that you cannot control, God himself is stronger and able to answer that burden. So can I pray for us? Father, today, we thank you for the reminder that you are the creator of the heavens and the earth. You are big and you are great. And yet at the very same time, you know the very amount of hairs on our head. You know our tears, you know our dreams, and you know our anxieties. I pray that today that you would remind us that you are there to take our burdens, to take our sorrow, to take our sadness, to take our depression, to take the heaviness of our hearts. And that God, that you will walk with us through the valley of even the shadow of death. So Jesus, I pray that right now that we would experience your peace. Remind us this week that when our fists start to clench, when our jaws start to clench, when we wake up in the middle of the night with dread, I pray that you would help us remind us that you are there to take our burdens and that we would release those burdens to you and that we would experience your rest and your peace. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.